Good evening. How we can stop microplastic pollution? Now, when I came up with the title for this talk, I did think for a while about whether I should pose it as a question. How can we stop microplastic pollution? Because the problem is pretty big. Was I willing to nail my colours to the mast with such a bold statement? But I do believe that we can stop microplastic pollution, although it would be no easy task. And I believe that the answer to it lies somewhere in this picture of former British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill, taken in 1940 in the, uh, in the uh, uh, cabinet room. What is it about this picture that can stop microplastic pollution? We'll come on to in just a minute. Because my talk is about something which the great naturalist Sir David Attenborough talked about for directly for only a few minutes in his documentary series Blue Planet 2. But it was something that sparked um, an interest in environmental issues like nothing before. Never had so many people been inspired to get up, to take action, to improve their local communities and the wider environment. They used consumer power to make their voice heard, and they directly lobbied big businesses and, uh, and the government so that companies fundamentally changed how they operated, and new laws were passed within months. We're of course talking about single-use plastic and the waste that it creates. That's some 300 million tonnes a year. That's equivalent to the weight of the entire human population. Now I started campaigning about plastic waste just over two years ago. I like to say that I've been today with Asher to it by about three weeks. Um, and I started with a campaign in Chester with the local Friends of the Earth group, and we did a campaign to make Chester the first city in the UK to stop using plastic drinking straws. We were successful, so we then took that further with another environmental organisation called Surface Against Sewage. And this time, we made Chester a plastic-free city. And in the meantime, I helped set up smaller organisations from other organisations like Plastic Free Pioneers and even Plastic Free Bangor, which is doing tremendous work here in Bangor. When I first started campaigning, about plastic waste, I found that people were genuinely shocked to realise that their plastic waste didn't decompose, didn't rot away like paper or cardboard. You could see that lightning moment of horror going off when they realised that every piece of plastic that they ever used, ever come into contact with, plastic toy down to a plastic drinking straw, was still out there somewhere as a piece of plastic, unless it had been burnt. But most people, most people are aware of that. What we then, a lot of people are not aware of, because we're only just beginning to understand the scale of the problem, is the issue of microplastics. These are tiny pieces of plastic, five millimetres in length, going down to sizes so small you can only see them with a microscope. And they come from two main sources. The first are the primary sources. These are pieces of plastic which are, which are manufactured purposely that small. So think of products that contain microbeads or micropellets and also contains nurdles. These are like the raw version of plastic. Pellets, which are then melted or moulded into whatever they want need to be made into, larger plastic objects. The second type of microplastics are the secondary sources. These are the fragments of plastic which have broken off larger pieces of plastic. And just about anything made of plastic will produce these, to, to a certain degree. And two of the biggest contributors are car tyres and clothing. Half a million tonnes of tyre wear fragments are released across Europe every single year. And your average wash in the washing machine will release 700,000 fragments every time you put on the washing machine. So where are these pieces of plastics ending up? Well, we've known for a while that they are in our seas and our oceans. But recently, there's been a rush of findings of them in all types of different locations. And Bangor University actually helped lead the way in this research. Um, last year, we worked with the National Friends of the Earth organisation and academics from other universities. And we, um, we analysed, we looked at water from a range of inland waterways across the United Kingdom. It was a great team effort involving all these other academics in, the, uh, in other universities, students from the Bangor, Bangor Wetlands Group, and even the very head of plastic campaigning um, to our friends of the earth, Julian Kirby, got stuck in. And here he is, wading fearlessly out into the River Thames to collect his, his water samples. And we found, for the first time, that microplastics were everywhere that we looked. They were here in the Thames in the heart of London, but they were also in wetlands in <coughs> England. They were in a reservoir 
in Wales, they were in a lock and a remote river in Scotland, and they were even in one of the most iconic British lakes, Oldswater, in the Lake District. The lake that inspired Wordsworth is now polluted with plastic. In another project, we teamed up with Surfers Against Sewage, and this time one of their volunteers actually swam from a lake at the top of Snowdon. She, she, she followed the river system all the way down to the coast, and she collected water samples as she went. <coughs> again, we analysed them for microplastics, and again we found microplastics in all her samples, from the top of Snowdon right down to the sea. And since then, there has been um, more funny research that have found uh, microplastics in other places. They found them in the fish and the seafood that we eat. They found them in plankton, mosquito larvae, uh, gla glaciers, arctic snow, bottled water, the tea that we drink, even in the air that we breathe. In fact, take a deep breath, you just inhale plastic. In fact, it was worth it, it's been calculated that each of us ingests around about the, the size of a credit card of plastic every single week. And we're only just beginning, just scratching at the surface of the, de of the dangers that these microplastics can be having on organisms, habitats, and the wider environment. And the jury is still very much out as the damage that this can be having and the harm that this can be having, the effects it can be having on us, on ourselves, on humans. So what can we do about this pollution? And make no mistake, this is a pollutant. We may not be fully aware yet of the effects of the pollutants, but it is a pollutant. And our recent history is littered with examples of us using and producing something which we thought was great to start with, but then we found out it was having untold damage. Lead, CFCs, even artificial fertilisers. So once again, what can we do about this pollution? Well, we could collect it up in some way. And recent and scientists and inventors are looking at ways of collecting up microplastic. <laughs> They're looking at this can include things like specialised rope uh, ro cleaning ro robots prowling our seas, um, investigating the potential of using microbes and enzymes <coughs> to digest and break down some of this plastic. And here at Bangor University, we're looking at the use of constructed treatment wetlands to filter out, to hold on to some of those microplastics to protect some of the most vulnerable waterways. Are these solutions, though, can, can, they, can they stop microplastic pollution? No, not in the short term. There is no silver bullet here. Wait, aren't we going about this the wrong way? We've got this flow, this, this flood of microplastic going into our environment all the time. Should we be concentrating on trying to collect what's out there? Or should we be trying to stop the flow, stop the source of the pollutant? Think about microplastic pollution in another way. Think about it as a, like a spill, an escape, a leak of a pollutant, like oil or sewage. What do you do in that case? Well, first things first, if you can, you stop the source of the pollutant. You seal the well. You mend the cracked pipe. If you have, if you're, if you have a water leak in your house, what's the first thing that you do? Well, you turn the water off at its source. You turn off the main stop tap. There's no point in mopping up the floor while there's still water leaking onto it. And the same is true for microplastic pollution. We need to stop the source <coughs> of, the, of, the, of the pollution, of the plastics. We need to think of this in the same way as a major oil spill. We even need to start using the same language. This is a plastic pollution disaster. It requires immediate action. And that action is the radical rethinking of our use and production of plastic. But how is this possible? Plastic is all around us. It's part and parcel of our modern day life. Single use plastic, plastic packaging, cartage, clothing, it's everywhere. We can't do without it. We must. Not all of it. Plastic is not bad. And I am most certainly not anti-plastic. But we must rethink how we consider our use of it. We must consider plastic a resource, a valuable resource, but like all resources, we should not waste, we should use it wisely, and we should not waste it. So much of the plastic that we use has just crept up on us, and it's completely unnecessary. This is the type of plastic we must stop, stop, start to not use. An example of this is the other day, I went into the supermarket to get a loaf of bread, 
chose my loaf of bread, I struggled to pick it up with those tongue things that they give you, and I put it into one of the brown paper bags they give you. Paper bag was ideal, it had no plastic window, and even said it was made of recycled paper. So far, so good. So I take my loaf of bread over to the baker and ask him to slice it on their fancy machine they have. Baker takes away, slices it on their fancy machine, and then puts my sliced loaf into a plastic bag and puts the plastic bag into my paper bag and gives me back. So the next time I go to the supermarket, I again choose my loaf of bread, struggle to pick it up with tongue things, put it into one of the brown paper bags they give you, no plastic window, recycled paper, so far so good again. Take it to the baker, ask him to slice it, but this time I say, do you mind not putting it in the plastic bag? Can you just put it straight into the paper bag? <laughs> so the baker goes off with a rather amused look on his, on his face, slices it with his fancy machine, this time puts it straight into my paper bag and gives me back. And he says, it's, it's strange, like, I don't know why we put it in a plastic bag to put it in a paper bag. <laughs> We've always done it that way, but I'm going to speak to my manager to see if we can change that. We've always done it that way. That's the problem. This, this stealth plastic use. This, we've just become <coughs> blind to the amount of plastic that we use. We go plastic blind. We need to open our eyes. We need to remove the cellophane wrapper from our vision. And we need to rethink how we are using plastic and what we are using plastic for. And we need to change the way we think individually, but <coughs> crucially, we need to change the way we think as a society. And that is why this picture has the answer, holds the key to stopping microplastic pollution. Winston Churchill he is holding a cigar. He is smoking a cigar. No serious UK politician nowadays would allow an official image of themselves to be released which showed them smoking, especially smoking indoors. The f I, I don't need to know anything about the person in this picture. I can digitally enhance this picture so that it was in colour or is in top quality. But the fact that it shows someone smoking indoors instantly dates this picture. It dates it to a bygone time, a time when it was allowed to be smoking indoors. If we want to change and stop micro microplastic pollution, we must move as a society to a point where an image showing anyone using a disposable cup, a disposable bottle, or any unnecessary piece of plastic is as dated in its own way as the picture of a politician smoking. Is this possible? Can society change the way it thinks so dramatically and how it acts? Well, yes it can. My grandfather um, saw a chap who had a cudgel by the front door and a revolver in the top drawer of his desk would never wear a seatbelt when driving, thinking it not the sort of thing chaps like him did. He would complain bitterly when my mother insisted that he wore a seatbelt when he drove. That way of thinking about wearing a seatbelt as a society had changed with a generation. My father, whose profession as a young man revolved around long liquid lunches, may very well, at the time, have lived by the phrase, if you're too drunk to walk, then drive, would now no more think of drink driving than I would. That change has happened within a generation. Society can change the way it thinks about big issues. Look at it another way. Your, some of you here will be smokers. Yet, not a lot of the smokers have <coughs> lit a cigarette and sat there smoking while I've been talking to you, despite how much you may have wanted to. None of you have. You are now not looking at me through a haze of cigarette smoke, as audiences in cinemas and theatres were 20 or 30 years ago. But some of you, maybe even the majority of you, but hopefully not because of the fantastic work that Plastic Free Banger is doing, but some of you will have drank from a disposable bottle or a disposable cup this evening. We need to make it so that drinking and using such items is as socially unacceptable as Drink as, 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 as smoking indoors is now. We need to stigmatise the use of single-use plastics in the same way that smoking and drink driving is stigmatised now. Only then will we be able to stop microplastic pollution. And this necessary
unnecessary stigma is already starting to have an effect. Just last week, <laughs> another politician, Boris Johnson, on his way to give a, give a political speech, had a disposable cup snatched off him by an aide. They did not want him, a photograph of him to be seen holding a disposable cup. Society is beginning to th change the way it thinks about this valuable resource that is plastic. And if we can continue that change and build on that change, then we can stop microplastic pollution. Thank you.